G'day there guys, it's Connie here again and we are back with some more stories from Reddit. As always, if you enjoy these videos, be sure to hit like and subscribe, and also the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Alrighty guys, let's get right into it. Okay guys, we're on relationships. This one was written by user RunHard, and it's titled, X is creating so much drama in my life that I'm having trouble coping, considering giving up my kids just to get it all to stop. I don't know where to begin. I was married for 13 years, have two small children, four and six, and after being divorced, I am now remarried to a wonderful woman, Donna. My ex will not stop harassing me. I have to communicate with her for the kids, but it's so contentious that the court finally ordered all communication go through an online site, and I had to change my phone number and move. It was that bad. I had my kids this weekend. Things went great and I went and saw my family. No incidents, we had a great time. Then I got this email. The email says, Jill and Marvin, the kids, report that they were in a traffic accident with you this weekend in the truck. They both report that the loud obscene exchange between their father and the ABC towing driver scared them. They both report that they were bitten by Greg's dog, Murphy, during their visit at your folks house this weekend. This is the second dog that they have both reported biting them. I have also posted their reports that they've been bitten by a large dog named Betsy at your in-law's house. They have traumatic memories of metal being scraped out of your leg. I hope that you recover and can get back to your job quickly. I hope that Donna is okay. They report that you have trouble walking. This is consistent with behaviour I observed at drop-off on Sunday night. You didn't get out of your new car and it appeared very awkward for you to unbuckle their booster seat belts from the driver's seat. I need to know about these things, please. Dog bites are notoriously dirty and prone to infections. Just because our children didn't appear to be as seriously injured as you were in the truck accident doesn't mean that they couldn't be stiff and sore and possibly have internal injuries for which I need to be observing. At least I need to understand why they were stiff and sore and acting more fearful than usual when they came home. Their mild to moderate bruising and scrapes and the chunks of skin missing from their hands and fingers are consistent with their reports of the accident and the dog bites. I will take Jill and Marvin to the paediatrician walk-in clinic to rule out any unseen injuries and infections. It would be nice if you would call or email the doctor's office and tell them what you can about the accident and the dog bites. It could help rule out tests and treatments that might not be necessary. It would also be nice if you would pay your half of their medical expenses, especially because the accident and the dog bites happened when they were with you. Today is Jill's first day at school. I could have taken them to the doctor two days ago if you had shared that they were bitten and in a traffic accident that was bad enough that required a tow truck for the truck and medical care for you. If you want to drive the kids to Santa Barbara and back in the weekend, expose them to animals that aren't safe for children and fight with tow truck drivers in front of them, I cannot prevent that. But what happens to their little growing bodies and the events that are being imprinted on their sweet innocent minds is very much my business. Please share all of the information regarding what happened to our children in the truck accident. Please share all of the information regarding the bites from the dogs. As a mother, it is very worrisome to hear my preschooler and my first grader recount the dangerous things that are happening to them, but it's even more worrisome that my co-parent withholds vital information about their health. Jill and Marvin deserve to know that their parents are working together to take care of them. Thank you. Now back to OP. I don't even know where to begin. The dog that was there had no teeth, didn't bite them, and couldn't have even if he wanted to. My in-law's dog is dead. I was never in an accident. There was no tow truck. All of this is false. I can't even find a shred of real events that could have gotten twisted. This comes on the heels of four days ago, her trying to corner me into signing away 30% of my custody agreement and refusing to let me even look at the details of the paperwork. I'm so frazzled by all of this that, at times, I think about signing away my parental rights just to not have the stress, but I don't want my children thinking I don't care for them and abandon them. How do you reason with this level of crazy? Any advice is welcome. I need help managing this. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, the whole time I was reading that email, I was like, yep, yeah, okay, fair enough. But then the whole time I did have that thought in the back of my mind that's like, none of this is real, is it? And sure enough, it wasn't. Let's go to some comments. If you're willing to tell random armchair psychologists on Reddit you're considering signing away your children, chances are good she's picked up on that and is indeed doing whatever she can to make that happen. Get thee to an attorney as soon as humanly possible. Fight for your children. One day they will know what you did or what you didn't do. Hang in there, dude. Don't give up on your kids. You can get through this. So get this. My stepson, when he was five or six, also went back to his mum after a weekend with us and told her all about the car accident we were in. And yep, there was no car accident with us either. We never could figure out why he made up that story, but of course since he told his mum that, she certainly was going to ask about it. She said some similar things too, along the lines of, I need to know these kinds of things. And I don't fault her for assuming that he was telling the truth, or for being kind of upset at the idea that we'd been in a car accident and not told her about it. So, if your kids actually for some reason did tell her this, I think her reaction is a bit aggressive, but not entirely out of bounds. If she's just making this up, well, that's pretty stupid in addition to being crazy. Why would you make something up that could so easily be disproved? It'll be so easy for you to make her look bad. I suggest you respond through your court-approved procedure with something like, This is incredibly strange. We were not in a truck accident this weekend. There was no accident or injury of any kind. I do not have any injuries to my leg. There was no tow truck driver and no argument involving obscenities with anyone. Nor were the children bitten by a dog this weekend. That simply did not happen. If they have bruises, scrapes and are missing chunks of skin, that is genuinely concerning. To the best of my knowledge, they did not have any injuries like this when I returned them to you on Sunday. I would appreciate it if you would take some photos so that I can see what these injuries look like and try to figure out where they might have come from. I do agree with you that if the children were in a vehicle accident, they should receive appropriate medical care. I further agree that if the children are ever in a car accident, this is the kind of thing we should inform each other about. However, in this case, there was nothing for me to report. I will talk to the kids the next time I see them and try to figure out why on earth they would tell you these things. In the meantime, if you believe they need medical attention, please do take them to the doctor and please let me know what the doctor has to say. Another comment says, Why are you so cared by your ex-wife that her telling you to sign something you don't want to sign causes you stress? It shouldn't be that hard to say no. Opie says, That is a brief snapshot. When it's every day or every other day, it gets stressful. I never know what accusation is going to be lobbed at me next. And when they divorced two years ago, Opie adds, Yeah, I already spent almost all of my savings to get the custody agreement I have. Dropping another 20k would be tough. To pay for it, I'd have to pick up another job, which would then not allow me to access the custody I'm wanting. Another commenter says, Turn this over to your lawyer. Please fight this fight. I know it's hard, but can you imagine growing up with a mother who chooses to rewrite history and reality to suit her whims? Opie says, Lawyers have been contacted. No response in three days. Emailed with this craziness this morning. Still crickets. Another comment says, Their mild to moderate bruising and scrapes, and the chunks of skin missing from their hands and fingers, are consistent with their reports of the accident and the dog bites. So, do these things not exist, or what? Opie says, I didn't see anything. A scrape on the foot from the flip-flop one was wearing, but other than that, nothing. And another comment says, how does Donna feel about all of this? Opie says, ticked. It's a major source of conflict in our marriage. Actually, it's just about the only thing we ever argue about. Okay, Opie jumps over to legal advice for another post four months later. I am in Southern California. I don't know what to do here. I am the non-custodial parent. I've had the kids for one week, four and six, during Christmas break. Due to the high conflict nature of my ex, we've been assigned a co-parenting person to help mediate. On the 30th, we were supposed to exchange the kids back to her care. I showed up 15 minutes early to the location, and we waited for one hour and seven minutes before giving up and leaving. She had been claiming she was right there for over 35 minutes. The location was an IHOP, 300 feet from the freeway exit. 
After I left, I got a slew of messages calling me all sorts of names and claiming that she'd just showed up, but that I had left. This song and dance has happened before. She said she would meet me anywhere, just to let her know where. This time, I called her bluff and picked a location two miles from my home and told her, the kids are hungry and tired of waiting. I'm taking them to my house. When you arrive at the location, 11 miles from the IHOP, text me and let me know, and I'll bring them right over. I sent her the location five times in text and twice via email. Four and a half hours later, nothing. I then told her that we could meet at the agreed upon location at 11am the next day for the exchange, just one day later than planned. When I woke up in the morning, she demanded I drive them one hour to a new location because she had a 103 degree fever and couldn't drive. There of course was a back and forth about her ability to care for children if she was too sick to drive. Ultimately, she failed to arrive at the location at 11am. At 5pm, I got a doctor's note stating that she only had a cold and was fine to care for the children. I didn't ask for this. I then called her and we had a heated back and forth, but ultimately I relented and told her that I would bring them to a location that she chose, one hour away and one mile from her house, under the agreement that she would show up this time. Before leaving, I sent an email confirming the location and time. That was sent at 7.48pm. We arrived at the location at 8.51pm and texted to let her know we were there. What happened next was so frustrating. No response to any text was ever given. Every time I would send a text, I would get an email, all of them stating the same thing, that she would not leave her house until I verified my location. I sent her six different responses to emails telling her where I was. All I would get in response is more messages asking me to confirm my location. I even made a phone call telling her where I was. Unfortunately, at this point, I was in such disbelief, I did yell at her and tell her to get her ass down here. Not my finest hour. At 10.21pm, with kids in high anxiety and crying that their mum had forgotten them again, we left and drove the hour back home. I have now messages accusing me of child abduction. I don't know what to do. I'm not subjecting my kids to this again. I can't bear to watch them check every car and get excited. I think I see her over and over again for hours while she plays these games. My worry is that the cops are going to come knock down my door when I've done everything I can to make these exchanges work. Is this enough to have my lawyers file an emergency hearing to get primary custody? I'm in limbo right now since neither my lawyers or the co-parenting person will be in the office until the 3rd. Yeah, man, why does the ex have to make it so hard? Like, the only people that are suffering in the end of all of this are the children. Like, it's so selfish. Let's go to some more comments. Someone says, why can't you just drop the kids off at her house if she's not feeling well enough to drive? It sounds like she's playing games, and you're letting her. Opie says, she's told me over and over again not to come to her house under any circumstance. Was the mediator alerted to this situation when it was occurring? If not, why not? Opie says she doesn't check her email or phone over the weekend. Another comment says keep the kids, stop dealing with her crap and file for full emergency custody this week. Opie says she is now stating that she's five miles away waiting for me to deliver the kids. This was not prearranged. Okay folks, on to another post from OP. six months later. I'm in the process of a 7.30 evaluation for primary custody of my kids. Two kids, seven and five today. Was another doozy of an exchange, and I'm fearful for the kids. I don't know what my options are here, if any. My ex was 53 minutes late to the exchange today. At 4.24, she sent me a text stating she was exiting the freeway that is two miles from the meeting spot arranged in co-parenting for today. She doesn't show up until 4.53. Exchange goes okay, but I know something is coming because if she's ever in the wrong, she has to lash out and blame someone else or invent a scenario where she is the victim. I had to wait all of four minutes. I got a text stating, I just drove by your car and the back seat was empty. Where are the kids? I said, wasn't my car. I have two kids. Then knowing where this is going, sent a picture of them in the car. Response, when did you have time to take this? Because I had plenty of time to look at the stoplight. You were alone. 
It's okay if Donna, my current wife, has them. It's totally legal, just weird to hide it. I then called her. She answered. I said hi. She said hi. And then I asked the kids to say hi. I then asked the kids, where are we at kids? At this point she started saying, hello? Hello? Is anyone there? I then got a text, thank you for the phone call, but there was no sound. I responded, I'm turning off my phone now. These accusations are bizarre. I got back, not as bizarre as pretending to pick up our kids, just tell me who has them. I called again, immediately with the hello, hello. I knew for sure it was a game at this point. I just ended the call. She responded, you can't just keep ending conversations because you don't want to deal with the facts. If this turns into another 49 hour abduction like New Year's, I will definitely be filing a report. Read the last post on that incident here. This is next level insane. I'm terrified for the kids. This is like raising to the level that she needs to be committed. Thoughts apart from just continuing with the psych evaluation I already have going? Then Opie comments, We went back to family court. Court ordered a psych evaluation. That process is about six months. We're one month into that. Wow, yeah, I can't lie. A psych evaluation sounds like the right thing to do here. Like, this would just be so tiring to deal with. I mean, I'm getting exhausted just reading about it. Okay, Opie makes another post two and a half years later. Okay, I want to give the timeline so people understand the full issue I'm up against. Basically, my children were hidden from me for 55 hours during my parenting time. Their location and the whole situation, well, I was lied to about the whole time. Been divorced five years. 30% custody exchange was to be December 28th, 12pm, for my half of Christmas break. Timeline, December 26th. At 4pm, I get a picture of where they're spending Christmas, X and the two kids, 9 and 7, showing a large snowfall and a message saying they're not sure when the snowplows will start. December 27, 12pm, another picture and message stating the same thing, except in the picture you can tell cars have left and come back from the first picture. 6pm, I tell her, if you get out tonight, I'll come get the kids as planned, in court order, from your house. 12pm December 28th. If you do not get out until the morning, do you just want to bring them by my house on the way from where she's coming from? I get a thumbs up to that message. 8pm, I ask if she got out. No response. December 28th, 9am. I ask for a status update so I know if I need to drive the hour to her house. No response. 10.20am, I ask again for an update. No response. 11am, I leave to drive the hour for exchange, not knowing information. 12pm, the exchange time. I arrive at the house. Text that I've arrived. Her car is there. Her mum's car is not. She lives with her mum. I videotape the entire time on the vehicle, verbally notate the time and date. Show her car in the darkened house on the videotape. I assume she's driven up with her mum to where she snowed in. 12.10pm. I finally get a response saying they're still snowed in. No plows yet. 4pm, I offer that since my parents are driving down and they have a large truck, they could swing by and get the kids on their way to my house tomorrow. No response until the next day. Note, I check all the roads in the area. All are showing being open and flowing traffic. I even verify with live traffic cams from half a mile from where she is that roads are cleared and cars are driving it. I have screenshots of this and the video is timestamped. December 29th, 8am. She declines this and says we should stick to orders. She also tells me her internet is out. December 29th, 11am. I contact the police about child abduction. I tell them the story. They say, here is an incident number. We're not going to open up a case on this. Take it up with the court. At 4pm I get a message saying, freeways closing down for the night. Been driving every back road looking for entrances without frozen bridges or backed up with accidents. It's an hour wait every time I fill up. Everybody's sure it'll be better tomorrow. Signals are better at least. I respond asking her to tell me when she leaves. Note, no freeways or highways are shut down. I check all state and local websites to verify. Even check Twitter and local live camera feeds. December 30, 8am. I call my lawyers. Tell them what's going on. Send them all of the timeline and they say they'll reach out to her attorney. 
At 1pm, they finally get in touch with her attorney, and the response back is that she is leaving today, and that she'll message me when she does, and I can come and get the kids from her place. At 2pm, I ask for an update from my ex. 4.45pm, still having gotten no communication, I call my lawyers again. They call her lawyer. I finally get a response. I have left. That's all. 6pm, I get a message. I am home. You can come and get them. 7 p.m., 55 hours past exchange, I get the kids. I ask them about the snow and being stuck. I was not trying to pry information or grill them, just a casual light conversation. They tell me that they've been at home for three days, since the night of the 27th. So I'm now asking some more pointed questions. I ask about what car they drove. Their kids, maybe the timeline is wrong. But they say they were in their mum's car because grandma had to leave on Christmas Day to be back home, so they drove separately. They say that mum said I told her she could keep them for two more days. I am furious. It was all lies. I am contacting lawyers today, but what are my options here? I want to have a reasonable expectation walking into this. My stance right now is I need action and need someone else to be as poised about this as I am or I'll find a lawyer who is but I do realise my emotions are elevated. Additional note, in the last two years I have filed a 730, spent 12k on it, two year process. Basically it said I'm the better parent, but that she might be improving, and that his suggestion would be to wait a year and do another 730, and if things haven't improved by then, it would be appropriate to swap me to primary custody. That report was produced in April this year. Jeez, imagine how you'd feel being lied to for so long like that. I'd just be seething. Alrighty guys, well this was an older post and I guess the beauty of that is we get new updates. This one was posted 8 years after the original. I was looking on my profile and saw my post in this subreddit from 7 years ago, as my ex was causing so much chaos that I was doubting everything. I took everything to heart and implemented several things right away. I became a grey rock and started documenting my ass off. I consulted my lawyers, and they said they advised several steps, the first of which was a 7.30 evaluation. This is an evaluation done by a psychologist. That process took a really long time, as the 7.30 evaluator got very sick halfway through. That took 10 months. At the end, the report essentially read, Mum is volatile and disorganised, and that Dad's home would be a more stable home for the children, However, there is hope that mum is starting to improve, so if things are still bad in one year, it would be appropriate to change custody to dad. This was a tough pill to swallow. Things were not better, and the chaos was just intermittent. So we kept just documenting and doing our thing. Eventually, we started getting a lot of emails from teachers that Jill in particular was often not bathed, never had her homework done, didn't have school supplies, and that she was falling way behind on her studies. We applied for a trial to review custody, and asked for primary custody to be swapped to us. That was the end of 2019, and the trial was set for May 2020. So, as you can imagine, once COVID hit, everything got delayed. There was a large amount of events in 2020. COVID shut down, Donna and I had a child, Rebecca, and then my ex started denying visitation to Jill and Marvin. Every two weeks I would go down, wait in front of the house, and no kids would emerge. Sometimes I would have the police come, not to force anything, but to get the documentation in terms of a case number. This went on for four months, before I was able to start getting visitation again. Eventually the trial was set for summer of 2021, and went for three days, and I had over 500 pages of documentation. Day one was entirely testimony from the co-parenting therapist who had been seeing for five years. She testified that my ex was the most difficult client she had ever worked with in her career, that my ex never followed a single agreement in session, and that she was a pathological liar. Last day of testimony was my ex, where she was caught lying on the stand and was presented with evidence that she'd been secretly taking the children to a medical professional for two years that I had explicitly not agreed to. So starting in August 2021, the judge ordered the kids to come live with me, primary custody and limiting my ex to four days a month. It's now been three years. When Jill was in fifth grade, she had a 26% in math 
and a 40% in English. For the last three years, she has maintained a 4.0 every single year and will be starting high school in Honours Geometry, Honours English and AP Biology. Marvin has also been doing well and just finished his first year of middle school with a 4.0 GPA and is loving his coding and robotics elective. They have new clothes and have learned new skills and responsibilities. Donna has been crucial in setting up patterns to help with success in school. Their rooms are both immaculate and they're the ones doing it with very little direction from us. They are happy and finally involved in activities and sports. Our little Rebecca adores them both and I will often find all three of them cuddle up together as one of the older two reads a book to her. Jill made the decision recently to stop going on visits to her mum. The chaos and drama started being directed at her. Along with lack of food, clothes that fit, etc., Marvin is still going for visits and we're encouraging that as long as he's feeling safe there. All in all, things are going so well and the kids are doing incredible. There are hard moments still, but it has all been worth it and we are able to shield them for the most part from any chaos their mum may want to start. If anyone is reading this that initially sent advice, thank you. When you are in the thick of it, it's tough to not feel like it's impossible, and you'll never be able to overcome it. I needed the outside perspective. Alright guys, let's read some final comments on this one. I cheered when I heard both the kids got their grades up. You've set them on the right path, sir. Good work. Opie says, thanks, we knew they had the ability. It's amazing what can happen when kids have the support with homework and a routine to follow every day. Soon they start believing in themselves and then setting their own lofty goals. Jill has dreams of becoming an investigative journalist. Marvin would like to become a nuclear engineer. That ended well, thank God. Opie calling and trying to do things face to face spiked my blood pressure. It's insane how stupid you become when you're in deep like this. I know it too. You only understand once it's behind you. The fact that he was actually shocked she was lying, when it was clear all she did was lie from the very beginning, and the way he's freaking out even though he has proof and she doesn't, it's just insane. She pulled him right down with her. I'm so glad that Opie did not give up the fight for his kids. They really deserve to have a peaceful home life, and it sucks that it took years to get there but better late than never. My god, that was infuriating to read. I can't imagine what it was like to go through. I'm so glad he was able to get his kids away from her. My friend got divorced. His ex-wife showed serious signs of BPD, and the divorce was long and nasty. She apparently tried to pull all sorts of shenanigans, and they wound up running all communication through a court-approved website. Apparently, one feature that the website offers as a paid extra is a grammar and language tone checker. By paying an extra X amount a month before you send any message, the site will highlight any phrases that are hostile or aggressive. And because the website is court approved, evidently this grammar checking feature is admissible in court. She sent a very hostile message. My buddy happily paid the extra cost during the divorce to make sure his messages weren't sounding angry or violent and his ex-wife apparently did not. He swears that it was absolutely worth the cost, both during the divorce and for the first year of co-parenting. Documenting is so important when you're dealing with a co-parent, even if both parties are friendly. As kids grow up and life goes through changes, you never know when you need to give evidence for something. I only deal with my ex in writing, and have every text and email for 10 years has been very helpful to show receipts for his allegations on numerous occasions. Yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of lessons to be taken out of this one, but I'd like to throw it over to you guys. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, we're going to leave that one there, and we'll move on to another story. Okay guys, we're jumping over to Am I the A-Hole? This one was written by user Parking Marzipan, and it's titled... Am I the a-hole for telling my husband's affair baby's family to either come get the kid, or I'm calling CPS? My, female 53, soon-to-be ex-husband Roger, 47, whom I forgave his affair, came home with a baby four months ago. His girlfriend, 22, could not handle it anymore, and brought the baby to him at work and left. To the best of his knowledge, she is in Spain. I allowed him to stay so long as I didn't have to do anything. Anything. 
Well, about a month ago, Roger had a heart attack. It didn't kill him, more the pity, but he's very weak and incapable of doing anything for himself. Since he isn't up and about, he cannot care for his child. He also cannot drop off and pick up his son at daycare. I have been helping, but I'm done. My kids are full grown. I shouldn't be having grandkids any time soon. I do not have any desire to care for a baby. I told Roger that I want a divorce, and I contacted the mother's parents. I know the father through friends. I said they had until Friday to come get their grandchild, or I was calling Child Protective Services. They just left with the baby, but they scolded me for being so cold towards a baby that had done me no harm. I view that child differently. Roger is recovering and I'll be moving out. The house is in his name, but I've never contributed to it. I have the equivalent of 22 years of rent and interest put away, and as per our prenup, my savings are my own. I work and I don't need anything out of this marriage except myself. My kids tried telling me to stay and help their father. I said that they were welcome to come over and help him with cleaning himself and the baby. Both declined what I felt was a fair offer. I do not feel that I'm acting badly, however Roger, our children, his child's family, and a few mutual friends think I am. Perhaps writing this out and seeing the responses will give me clarity. I mean, who can blame Opie for wanting to get out in this case? Like first your husband cheats on you, you forgive him out of the goodness of your heart, and then you're forced to, you know, take care of his affair, baby? Hell no. Let's go to the comments. Not the a-hole. That child was not your responsibility. Yes, it was innocent, but you're literally not responsible for raising it. You should have divorced Roger long ago. Opie replies, And God forbid something happens, I literally cannot make any decisions regarding medical care or anything. Fake not the a-hole. Seriously? This kid is four months old. You could not have possibly forgiven anyone for this level of betrayal. If you've been married for decades, it's your house, so get what you're owed. OP says, I think the baby's almost a year old. The house was a premarital asset on our prenup. I looked at lots of these comments, OP. You're not the a-hole for returning the baby to blood relatives who can look after it, but don't be the a-hole to yourself by abandoning your home without consulting an attorney and making sure you aren't entitled to some of the equity or some of his retirement savings. Don't walk away without getting all that is yours. You said that you have 22 years worth of savings. That's not a lifetime's worth. You might need more to be okay, and you should make sure to get it on your way out. Opie says, I have a little over a million dollars in investments. I'll be fine. He paid for everything. I kept all my money. Another comment says, Women these days are cold AF. Opie says, I can forward you their info if you're volunteering to take over. Okay guys, now Opie makes an update one month later. I am no longer divorcing Roger. There were complications from his heart attack and he has passed away. I'm conflicted. He was the love of my life but also a cheating piece of trash. To the best of my knowledge, the mother will not return from Europe. The child is currently with her parents. They asked me what I wanted to do. I recommended adoption. Not that I adopt the child, that they put the child up for adoption. They didn't like that suggestion. Neither did my children. They said I'm being cold and cruel. I suggested that since the child was related to them and not to me, that they step up. Neither has accepted that suggestion either. I was the sole beneficiary of Roger's estate, so I imagine lawyers will be getting involved in getting the child some sort of support. I will pay whatever is ordered by the court out of the estate. I will not pay one cent out of my money. That is all I have to say on this matter. Opie answers some more questions. The ages of Opie's kids. They're adults. I found out about the affair over a year ago. Nothing about this is convenient. Another comment says, So apparently the affair wasn't that much of a problem as you said you forgave him for that, but after he has a heart attack you decide to divorce him? It just doesn't add up. Opie says, I was not responsible for the child. The commenter replies, True, but that doesn't explain the divorce. I mean, you can divide for whatever reason. You do you. To me, however, infidelity seems like a better reason to divorce than having a heart attack. Opie says, I was not to care for the child at all. It was all on Roger. Can you explain how a bedridden man was to care for an infant? 
I agree you have zero responsibility to the child. However, if your kids did adopt, how would you feel about that as the baby would then be your grandchild? Opie says adopted grandchildren are great. New grandchild, I would do my best to treat them as such. Another downvoted comment says, Roger's will may have omitted the child due to the child not being around when it was written. The child should inherit a portion. The child should be eligible for social security survivor benefits. Baby needs a lawyer ASAP. Opie says Roger's will also omitted his two adult children. Another comment says, You were evil. You wished him dead. Now he is. I hope you at least feel a little remorse for what you said. Opie responds, I don't. He broke me. We were getting divorced for a reason. 70% of the posts here are fake. Yeah, my husband just died and I'm dealing with this child situation on top of it. Definitely going to post it on Reddit. Opie says, The situation has been dealt with. I was asked by several people for an update. I have now fulfilled those requests. And Opie responds to so many people telling her she needs to help the child. Why does anyone think I have the right to place the child with anyone besides family? I am not in any way related to this child. And the child is currently with their grandparents, blood relatives, withstanding in legal matters. Yeah, you know, it's always easy to sit back from afar on your moral high horse and say what they should and shouldn't have done. But at the end of the day, you can't really know unless you're in this situation. I think what Opie did was completely reasonable, but a lot of the comments seem to disagree with that. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. Anyway, that's the end of that one, and we'll move on to another story. Alrighty folks, jumping over to Petty Revenge, this one was written by user RileyJW90, and it's titled, Bought an alarm to go off whenever someone leaves the baby gate open. I'm cackling right now. My teenager and husband are constantly leaving the baby gates I've installed on the stairs and door to the mudroom open. The dog will then go into the mudroom and eat the cat litter, or she'll pee on the carpeted landing, or go up to our room to get into our trash or the diaper pail. It drives me bananas. Making them clean it up doesn't seem to deter them from constantly forgetting to shut the gates. My teenager maintains that they don't leave the gate open, so I bought one of those window alarms that has a separate magnet and then the main unit, so when you separate them, it alarms that the window is open. You can put these things just about anywhere, such as doors, fridge or freezer, cabinets, etc. You can also set a delay, which is what I did so it isn't alarming just from someone walking through. Currently upstairs with the toddler for a nap and heard the teenager go down the stairs. And, 30 seconds later, the alarm starts going off. I sent them laughing face emojis and they just said, die. I respond with a kissy face and offered to turn it up louder if they'd like me to but I'm sitting here trying not to wake the baby up from laughing. I didn't tell my husband I bought these alarms, so I can't wait for him to come home and find out about them too. Edit, for those saying the timer should be shorter, I agree. I just don't have another option. There are three settings. Zero second delay and the alarm plays every five seconds, or 30 second delay and the alarm plays every 20 seconds, or zero second delay and the alarm plays continuously. Other alarms I was looking at had similar options, but this is just the one that was cost effective, came in a two pack, and could get here within a day. Husband isn't home but hasn't gone upstairs or through the mudroom yet. He usually skips the mudroom and comes inside through the sliding doors. It's almost toddler bath time so I'm sure it'll happen soon. Yeah, good idea to catch him out in that lie. Okay, Opie makes an update. Husband did indeed leave the gate open. He made it back over to the stove where he had the loud fans on so he didn't immediately hear the alarm. Everyone else heard it, and I said, Who left the gate open? My middle child immediately gave up my husband and said, He did it. My husband said it wasn't me, and she fired back at him that he just came down the stairs and it definitely was him. Then the alarm went off again, and he said, What is that? And then, Really, babe? Before rolling his eyes and marching over to fix the gate. Everyone got a pretty good laugh about it. I'll have to give it a trial run and see how well it deters them from leaving it open in the future. Yeah, it might deter them from doing that. I mean, how hard can it be? Just close the bloody gate when you walk through it, right? Opie makes another edit. I keep getting comments about training my dog. Thanks for the concern, but she only pees in that one spot. It's a muscle memory thing. 
because we've scrubbed, steamed, painted, and replaced carpet at underlayment, and she'll still squat there and only there, nowhere else in the house. As for her getting into diapers and socks and underwear, we've worked with her vet about the possibility of doing medications, but ultimately have been told it's largely a dog thing. Some dogs don't care much for poop and other body odours, and some can't get enough of them. She will only go for the poop diapers, so she seems to be driven by the same urge she gets when she goes after the cat litter. We've been told we can put her on essential doggy Prozac, or we can just keep those things out of her reach. I don't want to put her on meds if we can help it, so this is our solution right now. If it proves ineffective in the future, or she starts getting into other stuff, we'll revisit the behavioural stuff with the vet. Also, keep getting told to get a spring-loaded gate. They are spring-loaded. The issue is that all of these auto-close gates also have a feature where being pushed open to 90 degrees causes it to stay open and disable the auto-close until it gets nudged enough to come out of the open setting. And one final comment says, Outstanding. My husband always denied leaving the freezer open because of not pushing the door quite hard enough to close it completely. We remodeled the kitchen recently and the new fridge has an alarm on the door. I get to laugh at him every time it starts beeping at him. Yeah, come on man, close the frickin' door. Anyway guys, that's it from me today. I hope you guys enjoyed those stories. Thanks for making it to the end, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a good day. Cheers.